Last time we were talking about oxy fuel cutting and mentioned that the speeds could be decreased by 50% due to high carbon content, which generated CO in the, uh, in the gas, which created a, recreated the boundary layer, or nitrogen in the oxygen, since it's inert in cutting of steels, um, can create uh, a problem. Another thing, uh, I, had, I hadn't brought a piece of flame cut titanium, not that I have a lot of good pieces of it. Um, I passed around flame cutting uh, pieces and, and other things before. That's flame cut titanium. You can flame cut titanium. It's got a pretty ragged edge, and you still have to grind off about uh, an eighth of an inch because the titanium will pick up oxygen. Um, we've talked about that before. I brought two other pieces of titanium for people who might be <coughs> interested in heavy section titanium. This is uh, something we made. Well, this has to go back to... 1977 or 78, so this is 25 years old now. Um, it was my first research contract here, but this is submerged arc welding on titanium, um, and you actually you can do it, but it turns out the flux will cost you for every. Well, typically, if I'm submerged arc welding of uh, steel, the flux will cost me about 50 cents for every pound of weld metal I, I put down. Submerged, submerged arc welding of titanium it will cost you, I estimated, about a hundred dollars of worth of flux for every pound of weld metal you put down, because you're. In fact, that that particular stuff was the flux was optical grade calcium fluoride crystals. I took single crystals of calcium fluoride and crushed them up to make a flux. Uh, you have to have very high purity calcium fluoride as a uh, base for your flux in, in titanium. It can be done. However, something that's a little more efficient is uh, electroslag welding of titanium. Electroslag welding only works basically in a vertical position, but you put two heavy plates, in this case, two inch thick plates of titanium, and you leave a gap of about an inch or an inch and a half in this case. You put some copper shoes on either side, so now you have a casting mold, and you just pour a wire in, you just feed a wire in there with a lot of current, and you have a little bit of flux, and that flux just gets carried up and reused and reused all the way along. And you can make welds actually very, very quickly. That weld was not made here, but uh, was made at Oregon Graduate Center a number of years ago. It turns out about 24, 25 years ago, we made the first welds, uh, electroslag welds in titanium that I know of outside of the former Soviet Union. Um, uh, here, right downstairs, you know, in the lab outside where you eat breakfast, um, and then uh, then things sort of got classified, uh, and so we quit working on it. And Oregon Graduate Center started working on it, so they made that weld, which which is a much better quality weld um, than what we had initially produced. But if you wanted to weld heavy section titanium, that would be one way to do it. it would be electroslag welding, but we're not supposed to know that. Although everybody knows it now, it's as strong as the base material. That's, the strength is not the problem. The problem with heavy section titanium welds for submarine hull construction is what's called the creep fatigue interaction, which the Naval Research Laboratory understood. You know, when you go down, you get a lot of stress, and you, every time you go down, you get uh, another cycle of stress, so you get fatigue, and titanium tends to creep um, a little bit and, and change its shape a little bit. Um, and uh, if you go cyclic stresses and creep, titanium has some serious problems mechanically. Um, and it was not just that. It was with the Alpha submarines and stuff. It was they were noisy. I mean, they could, get, they could go faster than any other um, submarines in the world underwater. They could go deeper than any other. That's true, but you didn't have any problem finding them because they were so noisy. Okay. And I, was, I had always heard that, uh, well, first of all, someone said, well, they can dive deeper than the collapse depth of our depth charges. Well, that was because they had never designed a depth charge to go that deep. They could if they wanted. And it was one of my friends from Colorado School of Mines said, well, if you hit them with the right type of depth charge, you only have to be within a few miles. <laughs> so, and actually, I thought about it and said, well, if you start dropping depth charges on the other, uh, the other side submarines, then you might as well use whatever you want, right? Because at that point, it's all over, right? So... <laughs> Uh, in any case, uh, it's not a problem anymore because they, they can't afford to, uh, to, uh, to use them. 
Um, anyway, we then started talking about arcs, and I we just barely started talking about arcs, and I basically said arcs are electrically augmented flames. That's my simplistic way of looking at it, in that you get rid of the boundary layer problem. You always have, well, if you can't get rid of the boundary layer, you have this problem of the, the stagnant gas layer at the, at the surface basically insulates the heat, insulates the surface from the heat transfer. Uh, and you can either condense the boundary layer, which is what we do in oxyacetylene cutting, or you can use electrons, which are not going to be uh, uh, harmed by the, uh, the boundary layer. And I'll, I'll show you some of that in a second. Anyway, 99% of the current in, a, in, a, um, in an arc is carried by the electrons. It turns out they have much higher mobility, 100 times higher mobility than the ions. Um, and so therefore, you can just look at an arc and don't have to worry about ion flow up towards the electrode. You can only worry, you can just worry about the electron flow down to the anode, which is the positive side. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those other things. I then put up these types of plots which you've got better copies of, or you've got copies of. Um, and we talked about, as if you have to have a certain amount of power in the arc. If you're at high currents, you won't, you won't be able to sustain the arc, because the arc is losing, losing heat to its surroundings by radiation and conduction. And the arc has to remain hot, um, typically above 5,000 Kelvin or so, or you're not going to generate enough electrons. Um, and in fact, the, the welding arc temperature is controlled by the need to produce enough electrons to carry the current that you're imposing by the power supply. In, in an electric arc, it's not a simple resistor. You can't model it as a simple resistor that you apply more heat and you get more, uh, more current, you get uh, more voltage. It turns out, um, in, in a, at least a welding arc, you have a power supply that controls the current going through the arc, and the arc will adjust its temperature to produce enough mobile electrons. Okay, and the arc does that by it can expand or it can contract a little bit, and it ends up setting up its own heat balance in terms of size of the arc and amount of ionization to, uh, and I'll show you that in a second, to to generate enough electrons. So there's a kind of a a voltage current. Um, product that you have to have enough power to keep the arc going, and that kind of goes through here in a sense. At high currents, you don't need much voltage. At low currents, you need considerably higher voltages in, in order to generate enough current. At the end of the day yesterday, uh, we were talking about the fact that um, light is emitted by the moving electrons, basically, and um, in a welding arc or an incandescent lamp at high pressure, because the electrons and the ions are so close together at, at high pressure, being high pressure being one atmosphere, that you basically don't have any problem uh, um, uh, of the electrons bumping into the ions, and everything comes to what we call local thermodynamic equilibrium okay, in the high pressure arc. And um, as you get to lower, lower pressures, basically there's a big enough mean free path between the molecules. Um, anybody have an idea of how? what the spacing is between molecules and let's say the air in this room or how you would figure it out. Uh, it actually is related to the speed of sound and I guess you probably could figure it out from the speed of sound uh, backwards so yeah you could do it that way. The, the way I like to do it is it turns out if I had a uh, a cubic centimeter of liquid nitrogen and I vaporized that it would increase at, if it was at room temperature, um, by about a factor of 500. Okay, the the difference in the volume of the condensed phase versus a gas at that you know you know you got an ideal gas law and things like that, um, 22.4 liters per mole. It turns out there's about a factor of 500 difference in volume between a gas and its condensed phase at room temperature. So you just take the cube root of 500 and you get the spacing between the the uh, the molecules and the gas. The cube root of 500 is about eight, so it's about eight molecular diameters. So that's a high pressure gas, and, and things will hit each other because they're only you know eight eight spacings away. If I get down to a thousandth of an atmosphere, then it's going to be ten times that. It's going to be 80 spaces away. And if I get down to a millionth of an atmosphere, which is not that hard in terms of 
these types of pressures, okay, the pressures that we would have these types of things going on, you're going to be, you know, uh, uh, 800 spaces away. And that means that the electrons, can, being light, are accelerated by the electric field very, very rapidly, uh, and they get a much higher temperature, and you end up with a two-temperature fluid, or the physicists call it two-temperature fluid, where the electrons are at high temperatures, and the ions and the neutrals are at a lower temperature. Eventually, you get to a big enough spacing that even those old ions, as sluggish and heavy as they are, can get accelerated and actually pick up a higher temperature, and then you have a three-temperature fluid, okay, at, at very, very low pressures. Um, in any case, um, the arcs we're interested in are in here. It turns out about the highest pressure arc that we can really deal with, you'll see this thing kind of stops down here at uh, 10 to the fourth millimeters of mercury. For all intents and purposes, about 30 atmospheres is about as, as good as we can do. Um, arcs become unstable if you have more than 30 atmospheres because at that point, the spacing between things are getting so close that you start getting into all kinds of fluid flow instabilities and arcs start quenching themselves and, and things like that. Um, that means that although you can weld underwater, for example, you can't weld underwater at more than 30 atmospheres. The 30 atmospheres is 450 psi, and in terms of depth, that's what? About 1,000 feet, right? 0.44 pounds per cubic foot or per foot down or whatever. Increase in pressure, and then about right, something like that. Remember that number? You guys ought to know that, right? From some course, right? So anyway, about 1,000 feet, feet down, which is deep, deeper than most divers want to go anyway, but you can get down to, to those depths. But you can't run an arc uh, at pressures greater than that. Um, there are some interesting effects with pressures in arcs. It turns out once the uh, um, Department of, of Defense it was developing a welding process for nuclear warheads, and they developed the process at Oak Ridge National Lab. And then they moved to the actual production. So the laboratory was in, in Tennessee. They moved the production to, to Rocky Flats in Colorado, which is now just is closed. But uh, anyway, Denver's the Mile High City, right? And the atmosphere in Denver is about 0.83 atmospheres or something like that. And it turns out there was enough difference in that pressure difference that the process that they had developed, which was very, very well controlled because this was you know, nuclear weapons and everything had to be like three decimal point type of accuracy. And they ended up moving the process to Denver and it didn't work. <laughs> okay. And they actually ended up having, it would turn out to be cheaper to build a chamber and repressurize the welding chamber to one atmosphere pressure uh, in, in Rocky Flats than to go through and requalify the whole process. So <laughs> they, there's, a, there's an article in the Welding Journal about 20, 25 years ago called Pigma welding, which was pressurized inert, pressurized something, gas metal arc welding or something. Okay, but it was basically you had to know the story behind it. Otherwise, you think why are these guys welding in this in this, in this chamber and increasing the pressure. But the story was small differences in pressure actually had in that case a big enough effect. Fortunately, they don't usually. Anyway, um, if we go and look at the properties of just a straight old plasma um, and look at, oh great, this thing, oh, I've got, I have automatic contrast on. Um, it's not going to do any better for me. Okay, this is particle density, which is particle density in the gas as a function of temperature in thousands of degrees Kelvin. So this is 15,000 Kelvin here, which is pretty hot. Um, and this is an equilibrium diagram of how many ions I have in argon. And this is the total number of particles in total here. That just happens to be PV is equal to nRT. Okay, this is the density in the gas as a function of temperature. So we're talking density versus temperature. That's basically the uh, inverse of volume. So this is a volume versus temperature for an ideal gas, if you will, but inverse of volume versus temperature. 
And this is the total number of particles, and you have argon neutrals all the way up, in this case argon, up to about 11,000 Kelvin. Argon will not ionize. Now, argon has an ionization temperature of about 14.5 volts or something like that. And so it takes 14 and a half electron volts to strip an electron off of argon, which means that at 14 and a half, well, we, we can talk about what we mean by electron volts and stuff in a second. But we start getting argon ions. As you start losing argon neutrals, this is total number of particles, you start losing argon ions and you start increasing the, uh, um, uh, losing argon neutrals and increasing argon ions. So the two of these should sum up to n total. And it does until you get to even higher temperatures and you doubly ionize the argon if you get hot enough and you can triply ionize it. And then you get up here, um, when you start getting past, you start doubly ionizing, all of a sudden the number of electrons, this was, when you had argon ions, it was equal to the number of electrons until you start doubly ionizing and then the two diverge up here. And it turns out the number of electrons, you actually count electrons when you're doing the ideal gas law um, as if they were other molecules. And the reason for that is they're negatively charged and these other things are positively charged, and so they do interact with each other as if they were another particle in the ideal gas. In any case, the main reason for putting this up, the theoretical flame temperature for a welding arc, I mentioned just a little while ago that the arc is going to adjust its temperature to give me enough current, or enough ionization to carry the current. So I have this arc, and I'm imposing a current through here, flowing through here, and the arc is going to adjust its diameter because it's pushing, it's expanding as gases and pushing against the atmosphere. Um, it'll adjust its temperature until it has enough electrons to carry the current that I'm imposing on it. That's the thing that's controlling things. If I, if I have a welding power supply and I turn it up to 150 amps, the arc will self-adjust self-regulate to give me enough ionization to carry the, uh, 150 amps. Well, it turns out, if you go through and look at the mobility of the electrons, and you look at a typical cross-sectional area of a hot uh, electric arc, and the length and whatnot, you can calculate that you need, depending on whether you're calculating up here or down here, you can estimate that you need somewhere between 5 and 30 percent of the gas ionized. And remember yesterday I told you that the physicists like to, well, yesterday I told you it's always, it's always a good policy to slam physicists, okay? If you can, you can say something negative about a physicist, it's a good, good idea. It, always, it usually goes over well with the audience, okay? Uh, um, physicists like to deal with a weakly ionized plasma where you have less than a tenth of a percent, one particle in a thousand or less ionized because it's one ion surrounded by all these neutrals or fully ionized where it's 99.9% .9 or, or whatever, uh, ionized. They don't like to deal with partially ionized plasmas because the mathematics gets to be messy. Um, well, it turns out the temperature when I'm at 5 to 30%, well, if this is 100% neutrals, and this would be over, over here, you're getting to where you're essentially 100% ionized, that's not a very big temperature difference from so the partial ionized has got to be somewhere in here. And basically the ratio of 3 to 1 or 5 to 1 ends up being in a very narrow temperature range here between about 12 and 13,000 Kelvin. I can just read it off this plot if I'm talking pure argon. But the problem is a welding arc is not pure argon. I've got metal vapor because I'm welding on liquid metal, and the liquid metal it turns out if I put up, put up a plot for, for uh, iron or aluminum or whatever it is I'm welding on, you'd find the ionization potential for iron and aluminum is not 14 and a half volts, elect uh, electron volts, it's like five electron volts. So you can drop these temperatures potentially by a factor of three, except we can't. It turns out the vapor is not purely five or thirty percent iron, it's not hundred percent iron vapor, it's a mixture of argon or air or whatever the arc is in with some metal vapors 
and the metal vapors might be 5 or 10%. So you end up with a very complex arc, and the physicists have just gone home and said the problem is solved. No need to worry about it, right? Uh, you end up with something that's very, very complex um, and really intractable from, a, from the mathematics that we have uh, available to us nowadays and, and even the computation power to really deal with the vaporization coming out of the weld pool and everything else. But in fact, if you go and measure the temperature of a welding arc, you will typically get around uh, 10,000 Kelvin, which is less than you would predict from pure argon, but it's substantially more than you would predict from a metal vapor. But it's some sort of average in between, and the arc is adjusting itself uh, to take care of all that. One of the reasons for telling you all that is uh, basically there's plenty of people out there. One of the typical problems, I mentioned at the very beginning of this class, one of the problems we have in welding is, uh, at least in this country, is very few people are ever educated in welding, in the basic physics and science of welding. And so when they have a problem in the industry, uh, the manager is going to say, oh, you know, we just had a problem that cost us tens of millions of dollars. We need to do some studies and improve our quality in welding. And so they take some guy who's a mechanical engineer or a materials engineer or, God help us, a physicist, and they pull him in and say, we need you to do research on welding. And the first thing these people will always do is say, well, let's, let's measure the temperature of the arc, because that's an easy thing to do. You just measure the light coming from the arc, and you can get the temperature based on the spectral lines. It's also a worth, worthless thing to do. Okay, It tells you nothing other than because the temperature is somehow related to this you know, amount of metal that vapor that's in the arc. And so... Um, Every five years, you start reading some papers about some guy who was just assigned by his boss to you know, do some fundamental studies on welding, and they start measuring the temperature of the arc. Temperature of the arc. Okay, it's been done every five years for the last 60 or 70 years, and we've never learned anything from it because there is no consistency. So uh, that's just one of the problems with studying arcs. Um, what is important and, uh, uh, is the current density. In fact. I haven't had to review a paper on the temperature of arcs for at least six weeks. You know, people send you papers to review for publication and stuff. So it was about six weeks ago. And these guys, sure enough, they had measured the temperature of the arc. Good for them. When you're first starting to weld, how long did it even take for the arc to touch down? Um, if you had a, um, a very uh, a power supply that didn't have any inductance, and actually we're getting more and more of those types of power supplies today, it will take something on the order of 10 microseconds to establish the arc. Be, typically you figure that the, the kind of frequency response of a, of a welding arc itself is about 100 kilohertz in terms of, and we'll actually I was going to talk about that probably tomorrow, but we can talk about it right now. Basically the, what's called the electron ion recombination time the amount of time it takes for these two to hit each other in the gas, and notice that they're both, uh, they can both, uh, you know, become a, a neutral and essentially get rid of the, the conducting charges, is about 10 microseconds. So if I had a power supply that could respond that quickly, it's 10 microseconds. In fact, most of the old power supplies uh, would respond in about 10 milliseconds. And the reason was you had this big, heavy, uh, copper transformers and inductors and stuff, and it won't let the current rise that fast. It's just an electrical problem. You've got a great big inductor, and if it, there's no current flowing, you've got to build up the magnetic field in the inductor, so it takes about 10 microseconds. So it turns out, um, nowadays we have what we call inverter power supplies, where you take your, your uh, AC, let's see, how's the inductor work again? Uh, inverter power supply. You take your your AC, turn it to DC, then invert it to like 30 kilohertz, and then transform it to the voltage you want, and then turn it back to DC. And the advantage of that is higher frequencies mean you'll need less iron and smaller transformers, right? If you're an electrical engineer, that all kind of makes sense. At higher frequencies, you can build smaller transformers. That's why they use 400 hertz on airplanes rather than 60 hertz because they could make the equipment lighter, okay? If you ever wondered why did they come up with 400 hertz as a standard on aircraft? Because higher frequencies means 
every transformer in your electrical system is that much lighter. Well, with inverters nowadays, we have semiconductors over the last 15 years that have gotten cheap enough. We can build welding power supplies that instead of being this old thing that weighed six or 700 pounds with all this copper in it, we now build these things that weigh 60 pounds and the guy can carry it around the shipyard and it'll still put out 300 amps. And that's because they go to 20 or 30 kilohertz to do their, their voltage conversion through their AC voltage conversion rather than using 60 hertz. Uh, and they can do this chopping of the DC current at these very high frequencies. In that case, you have much less inductance in your power supply, and now you're going to be limited by the inverter frequency. So that's going to be, if you're at 20 kilohertz, it's going to be 50 microseconds or something like that, right? A long-winded answer to a short question, right? Is that what, is that what you want to know? We're going to talk about arc ignition. It actually turns out to be, and it's, it's, it's an important problem to how to start an arc. I actually tried looking up before, and you could do it right again, you could get the rod right. Yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, in, in inverter power supplies, they actually put, in, they put artificial inductance into the system because, if you're talking manual welding, because the guy doing the welding would get it, you know, you know, he could quench the arc or, or whatever and get it, as you say, get it stuck. So they actually end up putting artificial electronic inductance in. It's not a real inductance of a magnetic field. It's just electronically it won't allow you to increase the current. You know, the control circuitry won't allow you to incur, increase it more than a certain rate. So it's called electronic induction, okay? Um, because you do need a certain amount of inductance in the welding power supply. Um, it turns out I once ran into this problem. In fact, I, I, I may have pass them around the first day. Did I pass the catheters around? You know, the ones that kind of, when you're trying to do heart surgery and they go in through the, the, the blood vessel in the leg or whatever, and they wind this little wire up through the arteries and they want to put a stent inside the heart or whatever. Not, I didn't, I didn't pass. Well, I can't remember tomorrow, I'll bring one of those. But uh, what it is, is in order to get the wire up through the blood vessels all through the body up to the heart, um, they have to have a stainless steel guide wire, and the guide wire has to be flexible because you've got to turn some pretty sharp corners and stuff. Um, and so the tip of the guide wire, they end up using about a it's stainless steel, and it's about a, um, I don't remember, about a five thousandths wire initially of an inch. And then they taper it down to even smaller, and they, they run a very small wire and make a helical spring around this, and they have to weld the spring to the tip of the, the wire coming through here, but they end up with a very flexible tip that'll kind of go around the corners as it's going through your arteries. And then they coat the whole thing with Teflon, uh, so it'll slip through those vessels and everything. Okay. Well, it turns out, I had a, working with a company that's now been bought out by one of the big ones that was in the paper recently about this type of business, recently being this week. Uh, should I go find out who it is? Um, and they had a problem because they had a they had a little arc weld on there, and the pull strength of that was by artificial you know, an arbitrary specification had to be I don't remember two two and a half pounds or whatever to basically break that weld. If you break that weld inside the body you got a problem because now when you try to pull that out, the spring uncoils and you got a little rotor rooter right through the uh, arteries and you just uh, tear the person's, you just, you just kind of like going in there and milling out their arteries. That's not a good thing. And actually people die and things like that. So it's, <laughs> uh, so they, they were actually failing it on their test things that they didn't ship any that way, but they were trying to qualify it and they were only getting like 1.8 pounds which is actually a lot of force, and it's, I don't know that they've ever had very many failures of these things, uh, uh, but they still had the standard, and to change the standard, to, to not, to ship a product, you'd have to go back to the FDA and get approval for a deviation, okay? Well, gee, forget that, you know, you'd rather solve the problem. So I was working with them on how to uh, improve the welds there, and they had, a, they had this is the medical business, uh, and you know, we're, you know, health insurance is just going to keep going up and cost is no object. And so they had these fancy welding power supplies. And the welding power supply, this is a very short weld because they're very, and they, they go down to, the thing went down to a millisecond. 
And the guys kept on turning. They said, well, we don't see any difference when we get below 30 milliseconds. And I said, well, there's a reason for that. You've got enough inductance in your power supply. The knob might go down that far, but the arc won't shut off. It won't turn on and it won't turn off that fast because you've got a great big transformer in there that stores the energy. So um, it turns out we, we solved the problem other ways than trying to go to shorter well times and stuff. But in any case, um, it, you can, uh, I guess the point of that is you can't always believe the knobs on the power supply. You actually have to understand a little bit about how the thing works. Uh, but most people don't bother. Okay. Um, let me, well, yeah, let's go ahead and put this up. And if I want to understand how different gases work in welding, um, it's been known for years. And if you go to the welding handbook, it will tell you that helium has significantly higher heat transfer characteristics than argon. And people, when they need extra heat in welding, they can switch from argon to helium, at least in this country. Not in the rest of the world, but in this country, helium is relatively inexpensive. It's about one-fifth the price of the rest of the world. The rest of the world has to condense air <coughs> and extract the helium from the air. In the United States, we don't have to do that. We have this natural gas in Oklahoma and Texas and Louisiana that has basically 99% of the world's helium reserves. It's just there as an impurity in the natural gas. Don't ask me geologically how it got there, but, but it turns out for, for many years, the federal government had a program that they would purchase, because when they first started shipping the natural gas uh, up the pipeline from uh, Louisiana in the 1930s, the helium was going with it, and people were burning it in their house cellars and helium is just going up in the air and you're just increasing the entropy and it was it takes significantly more energy to you know recover that entropy and, and get the helium back out of the air than if you had taken it in its highly concentrated form. It's, it's concentrated in the natural gas at like a, a thousand or ten thousand times the concentration as it is in air. And so it's, it was less expensive to extract it from the natural gas than it was from, from the air. So Congress had a program until the mid-1980s where they would buy any helium that the gas companies would produce. And, of course, they produced it. You know, uh, That was their incentive. They had a, a fixed market. And the, go <coughs> the government had these salt mines in Louisiana. It just pumped the helium into the salt mines. And so we have a lot of the reserves of helium. <laughs> it turns out Congress stopped that back in the Reagan administration, there's a big debate about it and lots of scientific studies because essentially when that natural gas is gone, the price of helium in the world goes up by about a factor of five. It's already up there in the rest of the world, uh, but in the United States we can still weld with helium. And it's known that you get a substantially higher heat transfer rate with helium. And if you go to the um, welding literature, like the welding handbook, it will still tell you today that the reason is Argon has a, uh, an ionization potential of 14 and a half volts. Helium has an ionization potential of 24 and a half volts. And therefore, you generate more heat by, with an, a helium arc than you do with an argon arc. And that's great, except I just told you the temperature of the arc has no effect on things. 90% 90, 90 of the heat is carried by the electrons, or 80 to 90% of the heat is carried by the electrons coming across here. And we'll talk about that and where that comes from in a little bit. But basically, um, uh, people never stop to think that these two statements were kind of you know, opposite of each other. And it turns out that you actually can explain not only helium, hydrogen, and what happens in CO2 welding if you don't think about ionization potentials, which is not what controls. If you look at the gas boundary layer and think about that pl flame hitting here, and I got a gas boundary layer. In order to transfer the heat across here, I can talk about a velocity gradient here, but I can also have a talk about it as a thermal boundary layer. I have to diffuse the heat across here. And it turns out that the heat across the arc, let's say, say that 80% of it's carried by the electrons and 20% of it's carried by conduction across that gas boundary layer. Now, we know that's got to be approximately right, because if this was a flame, an argon flame, I can get 1,000 watts per square centimeter with a 3,000 degree flame. If I go to a 10,000 degree plasma, if the boundary layer is exactly the same thickness, I ought to get about twice the heat intensity, call it 2,000 degrees 
or 2,000 watts per square centimeter. So if I can get 2,000 by the, across the gas, gas boundary layer by conduction, and I get about 10,000 in the arc, that says that 80% is carried by the electron. So it's whether it's 80, 20, or 90, 10, this is just an order of magnitude type of analysis. If I go to helium and I recognize that helium, being much lighter, has a much better thermal conductivity. And what controls the heat transfer across this boundary layer? It's just the thermal conductivity in the boundary layer. And it turns out that the kinetic theory of gases says that the thermal conductivity should be proportional, inversely proportional to the mass of the gas, the, uh, the square root of the mass of the gas that you're dealing with. Well, argon has a mass of 40, and helium has a mass of 4. And the square root of 10, we know, is 3, right? We learned that the other day, right? Um, so the square root of 10 is 3. It means that if I replaced this argon with helium, I would have about three times the thermal conductivity across here from the thermal conductivity of gases. All other things being equal, instead of getting 20% heat across there, I get 60% heat. I get a 40% increase in total heat across there just by the fact I now have more conduction than just the electrons. The electrons haven't changed their energy. They don't care whether they came from a helium atom or a, uh, an argon atom. Uh, and so they carry the same amount of heat through here. And remember, I told you that the melting efficiency, you don't remember this, but I'll tell you again, the melting efficiency of an electric arc is about 30%. Only about 30% is useful heat efficient. If I now am putting 40% more in, I can essentially get, if, if only 30% of 100% was what was getting in, and now I put 140% in, I just got effectively a doubling of my melting efficiency by just going up by 40% in, my, in things because I was only using 30%. The sensible heat that's available for melting is approximately double with helium than what it is with argon. So if I have a problem, I'm doing gas function arc welding, and I have a problem getting enough penetration or something like that, in the United States, I can afford to switch to helium for the next 20 or 30 years, or 50 or 60 years, depending on whose projection about when we're going to run out of natural gas in Louisiana and, or uh, Oklahoma and stuff. Okay, it turns out if I go to hydrogen, hydrogen is kind of an interesting beast because hydrogen is diatomic. Same electron transfer across that arc, but it turns out. I can add like 5% hydrogen to my shielding gas, and I can get the same effect as if I have pure, almost pure helium. And the reason for that is not because there is an increased thermal conductivity across there, but it's not that big. For hydrogen, it's the square root of 2 over 40, which is the square root of 20, 120th, and the, uh, uh, that's about 4.5. Well, that's not going to explain if I have, if I compare 100% helium to actually just adding 5% hydrogen into argon, and people do sometimes add 5% hydrogen into argon, not for welding steels and not for welding aluminum because hydrogen does bad things, but sometimes welding copper or things, copper with high thermal conductivity, a lot of times you need to use helium or hydrogen. So because of the high, high uh, thermal conductivity of the copper and carrying the heat away and stuff. So it turns out... Hydrogen with just a little bit, 5 or 10% hydrogen, can give you that same big boost that you get with 100% helium. And the reason here is that up in the heat of the arc, I break down the hydrogen into monatomic hydrogen. Actually, I break it down into hydrogen ions, okay? But the hydrogen becomes, dissociates into monatomic hydrogen. That takes, absorbs a lot of heat up here. When it gets down here into the cooler gas boundary layer, that, diet, that monatomic hydrogen recombines to H2. And when it does that, it gives up the heat that it absorbed up in the center of the plasma. And so now I have a new way of transferring heat. I dissociate hydrogen, diatomic hydrogen up here, and I reassociate it or combine it down here. That's called reactive thermal conductivity. And you've got a plot in your handout that, that shows a big boost in thermal conductivity as you drop the temperature. And that's true of any polyatomic gas in a plasma. It's true of CO2 as well. 
uh, CO2 breaks down into carbon monoxide and oxygen in the plasma, and just small amounts of those will give you a big boost in your effective thermal conductivity in this 3,000 degree temperature range that you have in the boundary layer. And so it turns out you get higher heat transfer in these gases than you do up here. Um, and anyway, you won't find that in the, <clears throat> in the literature because I haven't, well, actually I have published it. And, but this is a, this is a uh, overview talk. Okay, um, any questions on that? We actually are heading, we're going a little faster than uh, in some previous classes, maybe because it's a smaller group and you're not asking me any questions. I mean, I'd much rather digress if you ask me questions. Um. <laughs> okay, heat flow to the surface in a high pressure arc. You've got a paper by Metcalf and Quigley. It says that the heat transfer to the surface is due to the electrons, that's 90%. The con convection in the gas, the conduction across the gas boundary layer, and radiation. And a lot of people think that radiation is really, really important in terms of heat transfer across an arc. It turns out it's not. Radiation in the pool is about 1%, and we can talk about that. The big thing is this electron heat, and if I take the current, I have three reasons for generating electron heat. I told you that 80 to 90% of the heat in the arc carried by those electrons, and the, number, I, the current is just the number of electrons we've got in this thing. And there's three things I have to worry about. One is the Thompson energy, okay? The electrons are up here, and they're very hot. They're above the neutral point of temperature for the electrons. The neutral point of temperature for an electron is just an electron sitting in space without any kinetic energy, just sitting there stationary. That's usually how we define the zero point of energy for an electron, just stationary in space. Well, this isn't stationary. It's in a 10,000 degree gas, and so it's moving around real fast. And that is the Thompson energy, and the Thompson energy is just but uh, here it is. <clears throat> the Thompson energy is just, um, I'm getting a lot of light in here. I'm going to have to, wrong way. Okay, now you can see better. Um, the Thompson energy, Boltzmann's constant times the temperature is, has energy units, and that it can be equivalent to electron volts. Um, which is also an energy. That says the voltage is equal to KT over E. Okay? Kind of, if you take Boltzmann's constant time temperature divided by the electric charge in Coulombs, uh, you'll get a voltage. At 300 Kelvin, we're talking about 25 millivolts. If I use, if I plug Boltzmann's constant in here and put 300 Kelvin in and put the uh, Coulomb charge in there, the temperature of the arc is 12,000 Kelvin, and so it turns out there's about one volt of uh, thermal energy in those electrons up there. And Metcalf and Quigley estimate uh, they must have a, about a 20 amp uh, or 20 volt arc or something. They estimated about 4% of the total arc power is due to the kinetic energy heating up the plasma to 12,000 degrees, approximately. Then there's the fact that the electrons have to go across this anode boundary layer. Remember, I, we, have, we augment the, the, the power by getting the electrons across the anode boundary layer. Well, that anode boundary layer is basically low temperature. It's not ionized. If I went back to this kind of plot, it's ionized at 12,000 degrees, but if that anode boundary layer is at 3,000 degrees, there's no ions there. It's basically a neutral zone in terms of electrical conduction, so I actually have to accelerate the electrons across the anode boundary layer. And to do that, it turns out the anode voltage drop, actually the anode voltage drop, which we saw the, the beginning of this, the anode voltage drop is 4 or 5 volts, and that's caused by the fact that I have to accelerate the electrons across there. And that is, if that's four or five, if this is one and that's four or five, well, all of a sudden we get, they're using five, five volts. You get about 20% of your energy is due to the electrons are carrying that energy, both thermal energy from up, up here and the energy they acquire by being accelerated across this gap, this, the uh, 
they'll pick up about 20% of the energy. And the last thing is the electrons condense down into the metal. And the electron, the energy level of the electrons in the metal is lower than the energy level just sitting in space. We know that's true because there are electrons in the metal. And if they would rather be out in space, they would just vaporize out of the, out of the metal. But they can't do that. They actually drop down to what we call the Fermi level, um, which is the outermost or the highest energy level of the conduction band of the electrons. And that ends up being six or seven volt or five volts or six volts here approximately on what they're doing. And that says that if you have 100 AF arc, 25% of the heat is the electrons condensing down into the metal. The heat of condensation as they go from the gas phase and condense down into the metal at a lower energy state, 20% comes from being accelerated across the gas boundary layer and 4% is just the kinetic energy that they had from being in a 12,000 degree plasma. That totals 49%. It turns out if you do some other estimates, and they do it in their paper, conduction is 4%, convection is 2%, radiation is only 1%. You actually evaporate metal out of the well pool, and that's a loss of 2%. And the well pool radiates because it's hot, and it radiates away about half a percent. And you put all this together, and you find that you have only in this case, they say about 60% of the total heat in the arc gets into the well pool or gets down into the base metal. And what I told you before is the melting efficiency is only about 30%. Well, 40% gets lost as hot gases surrounding the arc. And then of the 60% that gets into the well pool or gets into the base plate, only about half of that actually goes into melting, and the other half creates a heat affected zone kind of order of magnitude of things. So that's where this electric conduction comes from. And that means that the heat in the arc is critical in, or, or the, the current distribution is critical in where the uh, heat goes in the arc. OK, I guess that's uh, enough for today. We'll talk about some other plasma physics uh, tomorrow.